Certainly the praises are for Allah. We praise Him, we thank Him, we seek His forgiveness, we seek His help. We seek Allah's refuge from the evil that can sometimes come from ourselves and we seek His refuge from the results of our bad character. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead them astray, and whomsoever Allah allows to go astray, absolutely no one can guide them. We witness that there is no God except Allah who is one without any associates or partners, and we witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prayer and the peace be upon him, is Allah's prophet, messenger prophet to all of humanity. And what follows this excellent salutation, Allah Most High says in the Quran, O you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared, and do not die unless you are a Muslim. So the Allah Al-Azim, certainly Allah speaks the truth. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to Salat al-Jum'ah. After a long week, it's always a blessing to be able to come together and see our um, our fellow brothers and sisters in faith. And so we, 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 we say TGIF, thank God it's Friday, um, for a different reason than the rest of the world says, thank God it's Friday. We thank God it's Friday because Allah Ta'ala has given us the obligation, Muslim men in particular, this particular day. It is today that, uh, that, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that um, it's today that Adam was created. It is today that Yom um, Al-Qiyamah, the day of judgment, will take place. And it is the day, Allah says in the Quran, that we should come together and we should um, seek his dhikr, remind, reminder, be reminded. And so that is the objective of Salat al Jum'ah. Today, is I want to talk about a very, very important topic. And the topic is making our faith relevant. Making our faith relevant. I was recently reading an uh, article in the Houston Chronicle. And the article, the, the title of the article was More People Drop Formal Ties with Religion. More Drop Formal Ties with Religion. And the, 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 the article was referencing, was, was referencing um, a Pew Research study. And um, basically in the study, the, the study in a nutshell was talking about how people in general, not just Muslims, but people in general are fed up with religion. They are leaving religion, even if they're not saying, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I don't want to be a, a Muslim anymore or whatever. But they're just, just leaving the religion, leaving their faith. And, um, it, and it's becoming very, very, um, very, very, very popular, basically. It's, it's becoming a wave in the country, really not only in the country, but throughout the world. But this study was done in this, in this country. And I want to focus on some of the reasons, some of the reasons that, that the, the, the study said that people are leaving the faith, don't, don't consider faith important anymore. Uh, faith as in, tying to a particular religion. Now all of the people, most of the people who left their faith, they all said, well, I'm spiritual, but I no longer claim to be of a particular uh, faith, a particular group, a particular sect. And most of the, this, this is from the study, most of the unaffiliated, an overwhelming 74% were raised with a faith identity, but left because of personal perspective. Many told the national surveyors 
that organized religion has too many rules, does not realistically jive with modern living, conflicts with scientific understanding, or that the spiritual leaders don't offer solutions for their individual faith journeys. Or that their spiritual leaders don't offer solutions for their individual faith journeys. And believe it or not, whether we want to own up to it, but even in Islam, especially in Islam, there is a concern, there is a problem with making our faith relevant. Making it real to us. Making it real to us so to the point to where we, 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 we live it, we, 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 when we read the Quran, when we read the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we read it seeking ideas, seeking solutions, seeking cures for our condition, whatever it is that we may be going through. And believe it or not, Muslims, we have problems, we have issues, we have concerns that we need to address. And the Quran, the Islam, the Quran, the, 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 the Sunnah, it addresses, it is, a, it is a cure for what we may be going through. And so we have this problem. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, إِذَا جَاءَ النَّصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ when, when, the, when, when, the, when the victory, when the conquest and the victory comes, Allah says, يَدَخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ And you will see people entering دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ You will see people entering into the fold, entering into the faith in waves or in crowds. And this particular um, surah was revealed during the time that it, when, when the prophet, the, the conquest of Mecca. Some of the ulama say that it was revealed um, from the, by the conquest of, the, what the conquest of Mecca is that the entire uh, mission of Islam had been completed. The prophet enters into Mecca with, um, with, 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 um, with, with all the men basically taking Mecca again after being thrown out of the city of Mecca. And so this particular surah was revealed, and some say that when this particular surah was revealed, the Prophet knew that he didn't have long to live, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after this particular um, surah. But the surah is talking about specifically you know, the people, yet the khulunna, people that will enter into Islam in waves. And so even after the Prophet died, people not only came into Islam based on ones and two, one people here, two people there, five people there, but people began to enter into Islam in waves, in crowds. I mean, whole tribes will become Muslim. Whole cities will become Muslim. And it wasn't because of the sword, contrary, contrary to popular opinion. It was because they saw Islam as being relevant to their lives. And even those who didn't become Muslim, they saw the benefit in befriending Muslim. They saw the benefit in being even a neighbor to a Muslim. And this is how we have to be. So what is the problem? What is the, um, what is the disconnect in making our faith relevant for us, making it real to us? Making it real to us. What's the, what is the disconnect? One contemporary Islamic scholar hit the nail on the head. He said that the greatest threat to any religion is apathy born of irrelevance. The greatest threat to any religion is apathy born of irrelevance. Now, it's, it's, it, I, I've done some reading, Thomas Aquinas. Um, there's, there's a very popular book, um, The Seven Deadly Sins. And um, this is where I believe this scholar may have gotten this idea from, because in this particular book, um, this, this particular book, The Seven Deadly Sins, and one of the seven deadly sins was actually sloth, laziness. In, pre, in, 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 in medieval Europe, they felt that um, being lazy, being apathetic, was a, disease, was a disease, and it was a crime. And so one of the things that, that but, 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 but in this particular paper, in this particular book, it talks about sloth, it talks about apathy. And, and, and in the book, it, it, it stated that, you know, what is, what is the, the, the greatest threat to religion? Being apathy, 
And, and, and one of the points that the book was making, it was the, the, one of the points is that, you know, when religious persecution, people think, okay, well, people in religion being persecuted, um, that can make the religion go away, or that can make the religion die out, or whatever. But the author was saying no, because oftentimes when religious people are persecuted, that makes them, their faith stronger. And the author went on to say that no, it is being apathetic, it is apathy. It is apathy that can make a religion irrelevant, that can make a faith irrelevant. So the greatest threat, the greatest threat to any religion is apathy born of irrelevance. When we look at uh, when, when we look at the, 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 the examples of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi so when we look at their example, we say that they are a people who made their faith relevant. They made it real to them. The Quran says that, speaks about not sending the, the, the prophets except to speak in the lisan, except to speak in the tongue, the language of his own people. The lisan, not just Arabic, not just the tongue, the dialect, but the language, the culture, the expression, the nuances of the people. When we come into Islam, Islam has a unique solution for the African American dilemma. It has a unique solution for the Arab dilemma, for the Pakistani dilemma. But oftentimes when we become Muslim, people encourage us to stay away from or to, 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 to neglect what our specific needs are. And so you have this whole wave of people. You know just as well as I, Muslims, many, many Muslims that don't even practice anymore. And we can charge it to their faith. They, man, that's the easy answer. The easy answer is to say, well, they, man, is weak. But the important answer is, are they making their faith relevant? Are the leaders, the teachers, making the faith relevant? You know, Imam W.D. Muhammad, rahimahullah, Muslims spent 30 years slandering this man. 30 years. Oh, look at the way, look how our sisters were Khima. Look at how they say, Salaamu Alaikum. Look at this, look at that. Or they don't speak Arabic, or they don't do this, or they don't get into the fit books, or this, that, and the other. But I, I swear to you, I, I've sat among scholars, contemporary scholars, from Al Azhar, in Medina, wherever, and a lot of the conclusions that they're coming to right now, today, this man came to in the 70s, in the early 80s, without all the fit books, without all of the, you know, all of the, 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 the discourse that is dressed up in Arabic. He came to these conclusions. Right now, today, people are talking about the importance of a third space. They're talking about it, the importance of, 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 of sacred space. They're talking about the importance of freedom. Well, he spoke about this in the 80s. His very last lecture was called Share Freedom Space. He talked about the importance of embracing who you are, being real to who you are. Not trying to be an Arab, not trying to be like anybody else, but be true and real to who you are. Muslims were just not getting around to that and understanding that today. It's like getting in a car and driving hundreds of miles just to realize that you've wound up at the wrong destination, or that you've got to turn around and go all the way back. And my point for even saying that is that it is we had a man in our midst in the 70s and the 80s, 90s, 2000s, that was speaking, teaching of the importance of embracing your reality, embracing what you're going through here in America, owning up to it and making it better this country. But we're just coming to these conclusions right now today. 
making the faith real, making it relevant. When Allah, correction, there's a very, very popular dua that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, used to make. He said, um, the dua goes, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa. Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from knowledge that does not benefit me. I seek your refuge from knowledge that is of no benefit. That, if you just really, really think about that, the Islamic education that we're getting, does it really benefit us? The way we are reading the Qur'an, the way we are applying the Qur'an, the way we are understanding the Qur'an, does it benefit me? When I read the seerah of the Prophet, that is the biography of the Prophet, what do I get from it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Do I pull out my pens, my highlighters, and see how it's relevant to me? Or do I just read it as I read anything else? Most, most Muslims, understand and apply their Islam through the eyes of someone else. Through the eyes of what this scholar gonna say, what this chef will say, what this brother would say, what this sister would say. To the point where even when I read the Quran, I have to see it with the, with the eyes of an Arab. And if I don't see it like that, then someone has told me that that's incorrect. Making the faith relevant. Making it real. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, so going back to this, 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 this dua of the Prophet, and I encourage us to, 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 to learn this prayer. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa. Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from knowledge that does not benefit me. We all talk about the importance of seeking sacred knowledge. There is nothing in the, on the books of Islam that says ilm al-muqadas, sacred knowledge. It's important. But what about beneficial knowledge? What about knowledge that I can grab and immediately apply? Because everybody will not be a scholar. Everybody will not be an imam. Everybody will not be an Islamic leader. But everybody has to be Muslim and approach the Quran seeking, um, seeking solutions, seeking to make it relevant to what they're going through today. You have marital issues, the Quran and the Sunnah has the, has the solution. You have financial issues, it's in the Quran and the Sunnah. You have family problems, it's in the Quran and the life example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's there. So knowledge that's a bit of benefit, when the Prophet say, oh Allah, I'll seek your refuge from knowledge that, 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 that does not benefit me, it's because knowledge should lead to action. Knowledge should lead to action. And the, the, the quote that I said early, that the greatest threat to any religion is apathy born of irrelevance. That when the religion becomes irrelevant, people begin to be, become lazy about their responsibilities. How many Muslims don't see the value and the benefit of reading the Quran every day? I know Muslims who know how to read Arabic, have read it all their lives, but don't understand a single word of what they're reading. It's better for you to pick up the English translation so that you can apply it and benefit from it. How many Muslims make five salah a day, up and down, 20 years of their life, 30 years of their life, 40 years of their life, don't know what the philosophy behind the ruku, don't know the philosophy behind kayyam and sajda. I'm just doing it, just habitualized by my rituals. But every ritual has a principle and an understanding behind it. And this is how we make the faith relevant, that we, under, that we seek to understand what we're doing, how we're applying. This is how we make our religion relevant 
And when it becomes irrelevant, people become lazy, they become apathetic because it doesn't connect with them. And nothing about the faith applies to them. So when Allah says in the Quran, Inna Allah la yugayyiru, certainly Allah would not change ma'bi what is with the people, the condition of a people, hatta yugayyiru ma'bi anfusihim. Verily, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is with themselves. When the religion is relevant to you, when your faith is relevant to you, it's empowering. When it's irrelevant, it's disempowering. You can't see nothing in it that will change your condition. And there's a very important point in this ayah. I mean, it's been volumes written on this particular verse of the Quran. Allah will not change your condition. There's a word, qawm. Qawm is the Arabic word for people. But not people in the sense of ummah, in the sense of the general Muslim body, but qawm in the sense of a ethnic group. Qawm in the sense of a tribal group. Qawm. Anywhere in the Quran you see the term qawm, it's always in reference to an ethnic group, a tribal group. Allah says that he will not change the condition of a people. People have unique conditions. As African Americans, black folk, we have unique conditions. And we can't run and we can't hide from that. And many who do, that's when their faith becomes irrelevant to them. And you see them 10 years from now, they look like somebody other than themselves. They go through all of these personalities in Islam. For five years, I'm, 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 I'm a Pakistani, but I'm black. And then the next five years, I'm an Arab. And then I began to change my, my, the way my dialect, the intonation of my voice, to even sound like somebody else. Yaki. Whatever. And then come into the African American mosque and want to critique the imam on every little thing. But you're not doing nothing. And my apologies if I sound too harsh. But this is, a rea this is a reality. This is a reality. So the intent is not to make anybody uncomfortable. But sometimes the truth is like that. It's like that. And so Allah says he will not change your condition until we change it ourselves. We can't wait on anybody to come and change our condition for us. We have to change it ourselves. It doesn't matter how many Islamic scholars and leaders and teachers come into the city of Houston and we flock to run and see them. It doesn't matter if we don't even support what's going on right here. if we don't support it and see the need to change our own condition. Bismillah wa billah tawakalatu wa ala Allah with Allah's name we put our trust in Allah. When Islam is relevant to an individual, to a person, it's empowering. And when it's irrelevant, it's disempowering. You know, we're talking about faith here. We're talking about Iman. That is the Islamic term, faith. But Iman doesn't just mean faith as we understand it. It also means confidence. 
It's, it also means security. Yes, it does. Because when we put our faith in Allah Ta'ala, when we put our faith in Allah Most High, it gives us confidence. And we can walk in the place like we own it. Because we submit to none but Allah. It gives us the sense of security that we need. Because so many people are insecure. And so, my encouragement, my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, here today, if your faith is not increased when you read the Qur'an, when you read the history of the Prophet, when you read the Hadith, peace be upon him, if your faith is not increased, if you don't feel more confident, if you don't feel more secure, it's something in the way you're understanding it, applying it, and making it relate to yourself. It's an issue with that. Maybe the scholar you're learning from is not fulfilling your needs. If you're hearing the same stuff recycled over and over and over again, maybe, or maybe just the way you're approaching is not fulfilling your needs. Faith should make you stand up and want to do something. This is what this this is the purpose and the aim of religion. Religion should make you want to not just um, be content with going into corporate America, sitting into, in the cubicle for 30 years of your life. Faith should make you want to become the CEO. If you have a landscaping business, faith doesn't make you say, well, I'm going to be content with just one or more. Faith makes you want to basically employ 20, 30 people and build your company. Because faith, as Muslims, you know, the, I, want, I, want, I, I quoted the dua of the Prophet, I seek your refuge from knowledge that is of no benefit. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the best of you are those who are most beneficial to humanity. So when the Muslim, when we go to work, we seek to be the best. We don't want to just, okay, well, I have all the faith in the world as long as I'm in the four corners of the masjid, as long as I'm in my house, reading Quran, doing zikr, fasting, but not taking it nowhere. And you look 10 years from now and we see that we're in the same position, the same place, the same space that we were in 10 years from now, something is wrong with the way we are applying our faith. Something is wrong. If I look as a Muslim 10 years from now, my family is not in a better economic position. If they're not in a better spiritual position, if they're not in a better social, psychological position, then something is wrong with the way I'm applying my faith. Faith does not make you selfish. It makes you selfless. It makes us selfless, seeing how we can benefit humanity. So when we leave out of our community, we move to another house, what will our neighbors say? Will a neighbor say, oh, I noticed that that lady who used to wear that funny scarf on her head, they're no longer here. Or will your neighbor say, we really miss them because they did something in this community? This is what faith should do for us, and this is how we make our faith relevant. <laughs> Our Lord, give us good and excellence in this world as well as good and excellence in the afterlife and save us from the punishment of the fire. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعَدَ إِذْ حِدَيْتَنَا وَحَبْنَا لَمِنْ لَدُونْكَ الرَّحْمَةِ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَابِ Our Lord, let not our hearts deviate after you have guided us and grant us from your presence a mercy. Surely you are the bestower, the grantor. اللهم صلي على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حبيب مجيد. Oh Allah, send your prayers and peace upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, just as you sent your prayers and peace upon Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim. Surely you are the majestic, the sublime. Oh Allah, we cannot manage this life alone without you. 
Please make of our lives what you prefer to be, what you want it to be. Do not allow us to act on our own. We hear and we obey. Our Lord, forgive us. Amen. Amen.